American car culture has found its way all around the world. It's a national treasure that has gone global and soaked deep into just about every aspect of modern life. And most people don't even know it. I'm Dan Stoner, and I've spent my life searching for the legends of underground car culture hidden in plain sight and telling their stories that nobody else can. Some you might be familiar with, some you might not. These are the stories you've heard of, but have never actually heard. This is the Motor Underground. The Shifters were now a real car club. They were too busy being rowdy young dudes to realize they had started a revolution, but they were about to change the world with their ground attack. Wherever they went, they caused a scene. In a summer full of car shows infested with Oakley razor blades and lion tamer shorts, the shifters were hair grease and cuff jeans. Loud hot rods on white walls that nobody had seen in real life in a generation. Hot rods were cool again. Car clubs started forming and made Paso the destination to where two or three years into this, man, half of Paso Robles was people our age in our mid-twenties taking over this town. So much that Anthony and Kevin, myself, my brother said, you know what, let's take the bowling alley, let's get some rockabilly bands from SoCal or San Francisco, and let's have an after hours thing, because there's too many of us overtaking this town, and after the, 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 the rugs are rolled up, there's nothing for nobody to do. So I started booking bands, Anthony started booking bands, I've always been a DJ, so I bring all my DJ equipment and vinyl and DJ, and man, after a few years, we would have a car show within a car show and hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of people at this bowling, bowling alley and just take over them. So it became like a subculture from this hobby, you know what I mean? And towards the end, I should add, of the days of Paso, when the promoters would visit city council, city council did bring it up and say, what's going on with all these kids? What's going on with all these primary cars? Well, they've always been there. No, not to this extreme. They didn't like it. They just, you know, it was, t Paso was like then and, and even today, a wine and cheese kind of a town, very cultured. And, you know, <laughs> these fucking hoodlums with tattoos and greasy hair and pompadours coming in. You guys are a freak show coming in here. So they just don't know how to, didn't know how to deal with it. You guys should know by the goddamn flyer that uncourt headers is forbidden at the Labor Day cruise. So shut it off. Now. No coolers, no beer, no soda pop, everything that we have. No walking, no breathing, and especially no shifters. And I remember getting out to the Antique Nationals and had the wise idea to, you know, because primer was cool back then, right? Like, screw your high-tech paint and your bullshit. So, so I was like rattle can in the car. <laughs> being goofy you know 19 year old dumbass and uh, I remember Robert Williams nobody wanted to say anything but Robert Williams came over and was like hey you guys and we'd already met him before and he liked us but hey you guys are cool and everything but you got to stop this rattle can shit you, these guys are getting pissed off with their with their paint jobs they're getting overspray and he was pissed you know he wasn't pissed but he they were pissed he got up to Ventura or or um, Santa Barbara. We pulled in, and for some reason I remember it was a Chevron gas station. All of us hot rods pulling in, we're getting gas. Of course we gotta shoot the shit, have a drink of water, whatever. The cops pull in. And this is the one and only time not to ever compare ourselves to bikers or the biker culture or the outlaw biker movement. But the cops said, who are you guys? Well, we're the shifters. Who are the shifters? We're a little car club. Oh, where are you guys from? SoCal, Riverside, and Orange County. Okay, what are you doing here? We're getting gas. Get your gas, get your asses in these cars, and get out of my town. And, and we did. And there's a sign, um, when we, the first year, in the back of uh, Anthony's Model A that says open 24 hours. We took it on the way out from a gas pump, and that got more footage, that sign, than the cars itself. So, yeah, we sort of enjoyed it in the fact that we were pissing off the street riders. And I think that's who we're like mostly rebelling against, because you got to remember in the late '80s and early '90s, the street rotting thing was huge. It was all high buck, you know, it was guys with the gold chains and pink hats, and you know, they were just they were kind of douchebags. A lot of them, some of them were actually okay, but a lot of them were just not cool, and it, the whole scene wasn't cool. 
The hot rods are pre you know, 40s, 50s, you know, early Ford hot rod, you know. It's, you know, that's what I consider, you know, the way it was back in the 40s and 50s, the way they built them. That's what we love. Traditional hot rods. Street rods, all glamour, and that those paint jobs and all that, just no good. Here's what's interesting about what the shifters and, and some of these rat rod guys were doing is they were still, you know, they were just exercising their passions for the industry. You know, it, it wasn't taking it to the ultimate level, but they didn't have the budget to get it to that level. But it's pretty interesting to me that what they were doing is timeless. It's not trendy and it's not gonna date. Those cars are as cool today as they were in 92. And it's looking back at what, what guys were doing in the late 40s, 50s, 60s, and it's a blend of all of it. And like I say, it's timeless and those cars are just as cool today as they were then. So the early years, um we had the great Labor Day cruise in Costa Mesa, the Orange County Fairgrounds. That was Tri-5 Chevys, Tri-5 Fords, and magenta, lavender-colored street rods. There were 40 Fords and 40 Chevy Coupes with the ZZ top freaking heartbeat stripes, right? That is the era that we grew up in. So when we'd show up to these car shows, six, seven cars deep, greaser guys, red jackets, these period hot rods, we were looked at like we had two fucking heads. In fact, a lot of old timers said, I don't know where these kids found these hot rods, meaning there's no way they would know and have the wherewithal to build these cars with Cadillac and Pontiac engines and flatheads and Olds engines. They had to, these have to be old hot rods that they found in garages and got them running, right? I'm sitting there waiting for the light to turn. And Anthony says to me, hey, don't look now, but Boy Coddington's staring at us. I was like, what, where? It's over the liquor store. Said, okay. And I look over and sure as shit, it's Boyd. And he's just sitting there on his car, just staring at us like, and then we had just gotten to this light that, that turned left. And it must have taken three minutes for this light to finally turn green so we can go. And the whole time he's staring at us and just going like, what, who are the, are these kids, you know? What is this? And we were only like, you know, 19 years old, you know, in this little T, uncorked headers, white walls, you know, Cadillac motor, black primer. He must have been like tripping out, like what the hell is this? And we didn't like make any like gestures to him and he didn't do anything to us. We just kind of sat there like, I remember asking Anthony, hey, is he still looking at us? Yeah, he's still looking. It's like, oh, shit. You know, I was just kind of looking ahead because, you know, he's the, he was the king at the time, right? And when the shifter started, you know, I worked at Boyd's and my job was to build the ultimate hot rods that we could possibly build. I loved what they were doing, but it was interesting because Boyd thought of it as an attack on him and what we were doing. And, you know, there was also guys like Jay Ward doing bulletproof shows. And that's what I'm saying is, Boyd thought it was an attack on what we were doing, but I looked at it as, you know, there's only a one percentage of hot rodders that can afford to do what we're doing, you know, if it's even 1%. These guys are still, they have the same passion that we have, they just don't have the same budget that we have with the customers. The number one thing I'm proud of is that we got a lot of young guys off their asses and started building cars and showed them that you could do it with no money. You know, it doesn't take a lot to build a hot rod and go have fun. Whereas, you know, the street riders from the 80s and 90s, that, you know, if, if you were looking at magazines back then, you thought, well, I can never get into this. It's, it's, a, it's a rich man's game. After, after Paso and working on the car more and actually getting a purple primer, or purple paint, base coat, um, and getting a thing actually more of like what I'm trying to do with the car. 30, cool. It's in a few bucket uh, chassis that's homemade. Uh, it's got a 32 grill shell, um, four inch dropped axle, um, got a Chevy rear end, multi four speed. Um, it's got a Molly dash out of a pickup. Uh, it's been channeled six inches, chopped three and a half. Um, it's dark purple, which eventually is going to have flames. Um, it's all traditional 50 style. Um, it's got 44 juice brakes, uh, reverse spring eyes make the car sit lower, 
and um, basically about it. It's got six twos. How did you learn how to work on cars? Through my parents and my brother. I've uh, been in it for a long time. I just like the style. And um, how old are you? I'm 18. Um, I, you know, people wanted to get it in magazines, and so in 2001. Uh, Rod Custom said, hey, we want to you know, take some photos for a magazine, not knowing that they're going to be on the cover. So I was like, cool. So did a photo shoot, and um, right after that, it was just like people loved it or hated it, and it, was just, it exploded. That had, I remember, that was in the infancy of the Internet, and that's when the ham, I think, first came around. And it was huge, but it got a lot of backlash from some of the people that didn't want to see that shit. Um, and I was in the middle of it. I sat. I was working for the competition, so I loved it. You know, I like to see them get their 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 asses beat, and then people praise at the same time. But because I wished I did that, it caused so much drama, and like on the ham and on everywhere. Even in the, even in Rod and Custom, and one old timer says like, you know what? It doesn't matter if people love it or hate it. They're still talking about it. Whatever, you know, and, I and I wrote like, you know, I want to take it down a drag strip one day, and but people it, even then was just like, oh fuck, there's a whole other fucking thing. Like you're gonna kill yourself, this and that. Well, and it's like, you know, that's what everybody was so worried about. But in the end, he proved him wrong. You know, he well, ran He's never going to run. It's never going to hit a drag strip. And I did it. And yeah. I did it well. Freaking thing caught air. The whole culture transformed when those two cars, um, you know, came out. So. Purple Beeler was a just phenomenal car. People went nuts over that car. They loved it. Really neat. Really neat car. I don't know if anybody disliked it. You know, there's some people that are just jealous of it. But most of the people I know love that car because it was unique and it was just different. So those subsequent years of Paso Robles really got the attention of two primary freelance photojournalists, David Featherston and, and Pat Canole. And they instantly, uh, in their own ways, in their own magazines that they wrote for, said, hey, we want to shoot you guys. This is so different. We're, 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 we're photographing the same red, blue, or black 49 Merc. You guys are so different. Let's go to a park nearby, a secluded area, and let's shoot you guys. It wasn't until, and I hate using this word, but I swear Anthony uh, coined it, the, the rat rod thing came around. And then all these older guys were like, oh, that's cool. And then he started identifying with what the shifters have been doing for years, and then it all kind of came together. And now, you know, 25, 30 years later, it's cool. Anthony, he made up that word. It's a fact. You know, like, he had like rat bikes. I remember him saying that. They asked him about that. Like, you know, had rat bikes, like motorcycles, rat bikes, and all that. We could kind of see us, we're like rat rods. That's how it all, that's where it all came from. We didn't never build the car to make it look bad. We built the car because that's all we could afford and the best of our talent. We never went like, hey, I want to do that and make it look rusty because that looks cool. And then people, I found people doing that, especially when they labeled it rat rod, as the sticker says in my window. It says, it's not a fucking rat rod, because it's not. It's just the best I could do, and the people are like, what do you want to call it then? I don't know, stop trying to make a big name. It's called a hot rod. We got 35 days to Paso. Our cars aren't done. We have no money, and we're fat. And David Featherston gets credit for the first person on ink, on paper, on anything, to say, rat rods command respect. And it's documented from the early 90s. And then Pack and All said, when the shifters come into town, you better hide your daughters. At least that's the image they portray and have a good time doing so. So we un unintentionally created this whole uh, uh, hoodlum hot rod vibe <laughs> about ourselves. Um, we were just doing our own things, man. We were having our own party with our gals and our music and our cars. And it really transformed. And then in subsequent years after that, car clubs from LA, uh, Bakersfield, Las Vegas, San Diego, and as well as the Inland Empire at Orange County here started forming. And before you knew it, Paso Robles was just overtaken by younger people in car clubs. You'd go to the a and Root Beer on uh, Spring Street and you just would see nothing but jackets and Betty Pagers, as Javier Mejia likes to say. There's too many Betty Pagers here. But, you know, black Betty Page looking rockabilly gals. And um, it was just a cool time back then, man. Hot rods and beautiful women. That was always a bonus for sure. You know, when you're different and you got cool things going on, the, the, 
the chicks kind of take notice. You know, and that was that was a big part of it too. Like, you know, that's something that probably no one's talked about in the film. Yeah, we got a lot of we got a lot of women. We really did. We'd go to the dance floor in the parting seas. You know, I've always been with a significant other, but for so many of the guys that have been uh, single, it worked to their benefit, man. Uh, there was times when I walk in a room, whoa, there's a gal on this side and there's a gal on that side, a shifter in the middle, have at it, I'll let you go to your business, man. So if it worked in that case, go for it. And I know you go by the name Billy. What's your, what's your real name? Or you don't want to say it? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Okay, so you're Billy. <laughs> okay, so Billy, how did you, how did you come to, well, how did you first come to America? Like, when did you get here? When did you come here? 93. 93? Yeah, 1993. Okay. And when you first showed up, like, what brought you here? I wanted to make a friend. And I want to be a greaser. So you were aware of the whole greaser culture Correct. in Japan, sure. right? Tell me about that over there. It's pretty big, right? Like, do you know Dice and all those guys? Yeah. So how did they, like what like in Japan? What was what was American greaser culture like? Like, what did you like about it? Uh, everything: music, cars, attitude. So I made Billy. You know, I had a, a tea bucket body. And he wanted, he always liked tea this morning. I said, Billy, what's your favorite tea? And so I, uh, I said, no, I said, what's your favorite hot rod? So my favorite hot rod is tea, like yours. I like, I like a bottle of tea. I said, okay, are you sure? You want to want a 29 or a 32? I said, nope, I want a model tea. I said, I tell you what, my friend, you want to build a hot rod? Are you serious? I said, yep, I got one for you. No, but I had a 48 Primus, which I still do. Then, then, you know, in order to join the club, I have to build a whole lot. I made him <laughs> carry the body out of the shop naked. I said, if you want it, you gotta get naked and carry it out of here. <laughs> Kevin had all pieces, but you know, then he said, if I want it, just take the clothes off, then get it to the car. So I had to you know, take the old shirts off, you know, fully naked, then piece by piece, put it in the car, then bring it back home. We're going over the grapevine and Kevin's license plate's falling off his car. So we finally, I don't know how, flashed him down or over because you're not going to call him on the cell phone. We didn't have those yet. So um, we get him pulled over and we pull off into the 76 gas station and it has been converted into like a, uh, a convenience store. There's no longer, they repair cars. But the bays were still there, but they were stuccoed over. And we asked the guy, do you got any nut and bolt? Because our license plate's falling off the car. And he goes, you can go in the shop. It's still it's got all the stuff in there. So we walk in the shop. There's not a light on in it. It's dark as hell. I mean, you can barely see your hand in front of your face. And here's this nut bolt bin. And we find the nut and bolt we want. And I just feel like there's somebody watching me. You know, we're already in the middle of nowhere. It's like Gorman or something. And we turn and there's a dude hanging from a noose. And he looks like this like 50s mannequin with his cool hair. And he's wearing a, a gas station mechanic suit. And like, why are you guys doing that to that guy? What's up? It scared the shit out of Kevin and I at first, but it was like, holy shit, there's, you know, they're going to bring out the gimp. And we realized it's a mannequin. And then Kevin's like, shit, he's got Sears diehard shirt, shoes on. Those things are worth a lot of, dude, they're my size. He goes, I wonder if the guy will let me have them. So he goes in and asks the guy, can I have the shoes off the mannequin? And the guy's like, dude, you can take the whole mannequin. We used to have that. We'd hang it on the 76 ball and we posed him like he was wiping the ball down as the ball would rotate. What's up with that guy? We want him. <laughs> the guy working there was like, why do you want that? Like, I don't know. We just do. So we grabbed this stupid mannequin. We put him in there. You could bend his arms. or like wire. And you put his arm around Kevin. So you could bend his legs and all this stuff. But he had like a regular mannequin head, like, like on a wire frame. It was pretty goofy. Kevin pulls out, hits the dip. Frank's head's going like this. And all of a sudden, Kevin's gone. He disappears. And... The head of the mannequin is bouncing around and it looks like Kevin's doing something sexually to the mannequin. And we're like, what the hell is he doing? Which is funnier now, typical, like, hey, we got to get over the grapevine, you know, play around some other time. But we realize what happened is Frank was kicking the fuse panel on his car and it was killing the power of the ignition. So the car would die. Get it back on the road. 
and we're going down the road with this guy and because his head is like not really attached to this thing very well it won't come off but it, like it's moving around it looks like he's having a conversation with me like driving down the road and Axel and, and my buddy Rob Markworth are behind us. And they're just laughing their asses off. The wind's blowing his head and he's got his arm around him. I mean, he had a perfect date, you know? He just became our, like, our buddy. And so we took Frank everywhere with us. He's like, a, he was just a silly 50s looking mannequin. And he became like part of the club. Like, oh, well, if you got a problem, you go talk to Frank. But Frank was passed around and cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I mean, Frank's been everywhere. Frank, Frank went from the, hanging in a garage to all kinds of horrible things happened to Frank. <laughs> he was always, he was a good listener. Not big on not not big on the talking, but he he was a good listener. And sure, we sure do miss him. I don't even know where Frank is right now. I mean, I'm sure he's someone's got him in the garage. He was a member for about uh, at least 12 years, and then um, I'm not quite sure what happened. Well, actually, maybe longer, maybe maybe 15 years, but I'm not sure what happened, but. Somewhere he got lost. Somebody took Frank, and we've been missing him ever since. He got kidnapped, and um, it's a pretty harsh thing for us. We've we've had a hard time dealing with uh, the loss of Frank, and we hope to see him again someday. When the shifters started building the hot rods that would change the world for generations, they put all those cars on coker tires. Now, 30 years ago, running a bias ply white wall on a rowdy hot rod like this one wasn't just a tire choice, but a real statement about the heart and soul of its owner. And the same holds true today. The right tire on your car is as much about you as it is about the car. The shifters made the park tilt on Coker tires, and it's almost poetic that Coker got behind this documentary project. So, make sure you subscribe, catch every episode of this limited series from the Motor Underground, and then go change the world on your new Cokers. I mean, who knows, maybe someday we'll be telling your story. <laughs>